Hello and welcome to this very special edition of Market Guru. Joining me today here in the studio is Bharat Ayer of JP Morgan. Thanks very much, uh, Bharat, for coming by. We spoke uh, quite a few months ago and I think a lot has changed since then. And I was just going through your straight hot from the oven report, which is uh, just a couple of days old. You've talked about a new valuation normal ahead. How would you explain that? Well, Vivek, I guess, you know, increasingly we are hearing about a new growth normal. Uh, because if you go back in history, India grew at about 6, 6.5% 6 for about 10 years in the decade from 1994 to 2004. And subsequently, we had that growth rate uh, getting up to about 85 to 9%. And if you see, valuations have actually followed this trend. The market on an average traded on a multiple of about 12 to 13 times between 1994 and 2004, and subsequently went up to about 15 times. Uh, what we are arguing now is that it's increasingly looking likely that, you know, the India's potential trend growth rate could again come back a bit unless we see decisive policy action. And if the decisive and if the growth trend were to come back to about six, six and a half percent, what we are arguing for is that valuations will stand corrected too. Mm. Because you know, if you have a new growth normal, mm. we're also going to have a new valuation normal. So the new growth normal, according to you, and you go on to say this in your report, you say that it has fallen much below the seven to seven and a half percent level that policymakers are still holding on to. Yeah. So you're questioning that belief. Well, we are questioning that belief, uh, but we are hopeful that something will be done to address that concern because I don't think all is lost. Mm. What we are seeing now is, you know, persistently core inflation has been high despite growth rates falling off. And that questions the growth, the potential growth rate of the economy. Mm. And we believe that it's perhaps not at 7, 7.5%, but perhaps closer to 6%. And what we'd like to see is decisive policy action to take that growth rate back up. But if that cannot be done for any number of reasons, then what we are arguing for is that valuations will stand corrected. Okay. We'll, we'll go into a little more details of that. But uh, just another point. You make the important point. You said the growth slowdown is becoming more structural yeah. than cyclical. That's a very important point that you're making. It is, Vivek, because what we're realizing now is that we've had an investment slowdown for nearly four years. And that's put severe capacity constraints on the economy's ability to grow. And we need structural reform to sort that out. Mm. It's not part of your normal business cycle where you, know, you can tweak a few macro variables here and there, particularly interest rates, and get the economy back to its trend level growth rate. What we're figuring out right now is that interest rates are a very small part of the overall equation. And we need serious policy reform in a lot of areas to address the problem that we have. And you know, that's why we believe that perhaps the, trend gro the potential growth rate of the economy has trended down and mm. it needs structural reforms rather than just cyclical tinkering of a few variables here and there. Mm. It's interesting you say that. And uh, just to get a bit of the earnings bit, just to understand the valuation normal, Bharat, you've talked about the fact that a 12-month forward P multiple of 12 to 13x, if GDP growth were to slow down to 5.5 to 6.5 over the next two to three years, what would this really mean in terms of earnings and returns? Well, the way we look at it is that if you were to look at uh, the valuations on a historic perspective, you'd find that you know, a valuation number of 12 to 13 times would actually be one standard deviation below mean. Mm -hmm. And that would suggest that the market is cheap. What we are arguing is that that may not necessarily be the case. Because you know, valuations have to be seen in conjunction with growth rates. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, if the economy is not going to grow at 85 or 9%, and so earnings are not going to grow at 20%, but on the other hand, we have the economy growing at 55 to 6%, and earnings growing at about 10%, then perhaps you know, this is, these valuations are reasonable. And what we are arguing for is that you know, market returns will be linked more to earnings growth, and we may not see re-rating until and unless we see signs that structural issues are being addressed to take us to a higher plane in terms mm. of growth. Mm. You make the other important point. You say the current street estimates of 12% earnings growth for FY13, you believe, could need some trimming. Yes. Can you elaborate? What is some trimming? Well, I would expect earnings to come in, earnings growth to come in at about 8% or thereabouts That's for the it? current year. Yeah, because, you know, let's face it, we are still seeing a lot of cyclical headwinds as far as the economy is concerned. And, you know, GDP growth numbers are being cut as we speak. Yeah. Uh, also, we must realize that, you know, oil after correcting nicely has again gone back up. I mean, from $90 yeah. back to about $115. So the pressures on uh, corporate profitabilities are very much there. 
and I don't think that's fully reflected right now. Having said that, I'll also say that you know we are perhaps in a better uh, environment this time around than we were in the past, because typically we've always started expecting earnings to grow at about 20, 25 percent, and then most of the cuts happen into the second half of the fiscal year. Mm. This time around, luckily, you know, I think expectations are far more reasonable, and we are at 12 percent, and which is the word we've used the word trimming, because you know we don't see the need for a sharp cut. Mm. But we do see, but you know, twelve to eight percent is quite a lot of trimming, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it, but, but it's trimming all the same. It's not, you know, it's sure, not a nasty okay. cut coming down from twenty, twenty-five percent to eight percent, as we've seen sure. in uh, okay. uh, past years. But then, if that be the case, do you think the current levels at which this market is in terms of valuations, then they don't certainly look cheap? Well, as I said, valuations are reasonable. I mean, you know, we can argue whether earnings growth will come in at 8% or 12%. But even if you were to say consider 8%, the market's perhaps trading at about 13 times forward earnings, mm. which is not expensive. It's not cheap, but it's not expensive either. It's reasonable according. It's reasonable. So I don't worry really about, you know, the market's valuation per se at this point in time. What we're really worried about is, you know, how do we get this market valuation to go up? And I guess, you know, that's where I think, you know, the fear I have is this market is perhaps inexpensive, but it could remain inexpensive until and unless we see policy action. And, and, and just to go to that, a report which you came out with on 24th August, which uh, I found was a very emotional line that you used as the headline, which said, keeping the faith, but for how long? Yeah. For how long? Well, it depends. As I said, you know, we are hopeful because, you know, we do understand the government's constraints. And, uh, you know, uh, if you look at the market at large, I think, you know, uh, reforms were expected to pick up after the presidential election was over. Yeah. But that has not happened for various reasons. And we do believe a window of opportunity is there. You know, once the monsoon session of parliament is over all the way until the uh, uh, state elections come around in uh, mid to late November. And we believe that's a decent political window of opportunity. And so we remain hopeful that, uh, you know. But there were some more windows like that, that the market <laughs> thought would open, but remained shut. One lives in hope, Vivek. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. All right. So let me pick on a little bit more. You also make the point, just to go away a bit, and we'll come back to what's going on in India. But you make an interesting point. You've said the Indian equities have done well in the last three months. Yes. And they've actually, in dollar terms, they've been up 12% and have outperformed the MSCI emerging market by 500 basis points. Yes. Does that, according to you, explain the reason why we've got a fairly good inflow of FIA money in the last one and a half months? We've attracted a fair amount, even yeah. from the region point of view, if yeah. you see, I think it's almost 65 watt percent. Yes. Why, why is that happening? On the one hand, we are in the situation that you've just outlined. On the other hand, you're seeing a continuous inflow and a strong inflow of FII money. Why? Well, Vivek, I guess, you know, uh, while we sit and do agonize uh, about the issues that we have in our country, I guess, uh, you know, other countries seem to have their own problems too. And from a global asset allocator's point of view, perhaps, you know, India is a little better than other parts of the world. Because let's face it, you know, global... And that's largely because they've deteriorated more than us? <laughs> they have deteriorated more than because us. we don't seem to have improved. No, I don't think we've improved. As I mentioned in my report, yes, I mean, yes. uh, you, know, uh, you know, we've been overweight in India since June. And mm. that despite the fact that, you know, if anything, economic fundamentals in India have deteriorated too. But that's because the deterioration in other parts is perhaps more uh, uh, strong at this point in time. But that said, I guess, you know, the reason our markets have done well, I think globally one asset classes have done well. And that's basically been on expectations that there'll be more monetary easing uh, mm. into September, uh, both in the US and Europe. And obviously that liquidity has to find its way somewhere. And the hope was that, you know, India would reform. Mm. And that was the reason I think we got a disproportionate share of the funds that came in and we outperformed. And is it that hope which made you put an overweight? And are you questioning that hope now? Well, it was, partially it was that hope. We were very hopeful that, uh, you know, reforms would get a leg up. Mm. And that was the reason why we uh, upgraded India to an overweight from neutral in June. That said, I guess I'm not questioning that hope, but yes, like a lot of other people, I'm running a bit, out of patience. <laughs> I'm a bit frustrated that uh, you know we've not seen the kind of policy action that we would have liked to have seen. That said, we do, as I said, we do understand the government's constraints, and which is the reason you know we're beginning to feel that you know maybe all of that may not happen, but mm. we still remain hopeful. I mean, there is a window of opportunity, as I mentioned, mm. and we need to see what happens, and which is the reason what we're telling clients right now is that uh, look, you had a good run. And uh, we don't know what's going to happen. We remain hopeful, but that hope may or may not materialize, which is the reason we're asking clients to hedge positions at these levels. Hmm. You talked about oil a bit, and I know that's uh, personally an area you've tracked very closely, oil and gas companies as well. 
Uh, what are you making of it? I mean, it's pretty much a 28% jump if you look at it in terms of, and I think somewhere all of us seem to have missed that because yes. when it was falling, we were all very exuberant yes. about the fact that oil is down, oil is down, but we've pretty much come back to the we, comfort I, levels. We more or less come back to levels where, you know, it's again a serious issue. Mm. And, uh, well, I think there's not much we can do because, you know, I guess there are a variety of issues, you know, dogging the oil markets at this point in time. You know, there are weather issues, there are shutdown issues, and then, of course, there is the geopolitical angle. So I guess, you know, it's going to be very difficult to call. But that said, I guess, you know, uh, we do need a local response. Mm. I want to pick a bit more on your hope factor. You've talked about the expectations that the market had from the government. The markets were hoping for measures to curb demand pressures and the fiscal deficit that is a diesel price hike not happened. Revive the investment cycle over the medium term that is allowing increasing direct FDI, multi-brand retail, aviation not happened. Clearances for investment projects, faster clearances, hope nothing's happened. And finally, uh, you've talked about, particularly in the power, coal, mining, concessions, and we've seen what's played out. Yeah. None of these seem to have happened. happened yeah. Is that a cause for concern? That, and they don't seem likely to happen either. It, it is a cause of concern, Vivek, which is the reason, you know, that's the reason. And you've also talked about, you know, the whole CAG report, because there's such a latest report. Yeah. That that nothing seems to have moved. So even this eight-week window now seems questionable. Well, as I said, you know, we live in hope. Uh, or at least you know, these expectations. These expectations, yes. I mean, which, which is exactly, I mean, the reason we, 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 we were very positive in June was because, you know, we thought uh, we will see a, a movement on all these issues. Mm. And, uh, well, politics is the art of the possible. And uh, it's not been possible to get going on some of these initiatives or, you know, quite a lot of mm. these initiatives. We remain hopeful, but as I mentioned, you know, it, it looks very difficult that all the expectations will be met. When would you review your I overpaid? Th I think, uh, you know, uh, we would, uh, I mean, as I said, you know, we're already on watch because, you know, that mm -hmm. is the reason we're asking clients to hedge uh, their positions. Could you explain that a bit when you say hedge positions? Well, what are you really telling me? Uh, well, actually, if you look at the derivatives market right now, Vivek, you find that, you know, implied volatility is very, very low and hedging costs are not very expensive. They're not very demanding, which is the reason we believe that, you know, you've made good money. I mean, 12% in two months is not bad. 500 basis points outperformance, I'd take it over two years. Yeah. And which is the reason, you know, uh, given hedging costs right now, I mean, we believe that, you know, it's probably a good, uh, uh, you know, strategy to hedge your positions right now, at least so that, you know, you protect your ups you protect your downside and you, uh, you know, lock in some of the upside that you've got. Yeah. I think a good time to hedge, uh, to, you know, revisit the situation would perhaps be sometime uh, uh, late into September. Because by, by then, when your eight-week <laughs> period would be over. No, my eight month uh, eight, eight week, week would, window would, would be over. Would, would, would be starting off because you know the monsoon yeah. session effectively ends on September eighth, mm. and you know I, my eight week period is September eighth to you know November fifteenth okay. thereabouts because you know then November fifteenth you have the state level elections coming up again, so that's that's the window I'm looking for in mm. terms of activity, and I think you know midway into the uh, into the window would be a good opportunity to you know revisit the whole situation mm. and see what can be done and uh, you know uh, what is not being addressed. What about uh, the rupee? At least that seems to have stabilized, though of course it's also slipped on from where it had reached. It had strengthened, but at least it's stable. You're not seeing the kind of yes. volatility of the kind we saw in the past. Is that a comfort level for you? See, or I has think, that become the new normal now? Everybody's accepted it. See, I think, you know, for the rupee, something like, you know, 55 to 56 and a half, 57, I think is more or less the new normal mm. until, you know, you have a, a serious change. Uh, either in the global scenario or in the local scenario. So I think, you know, we're fairly comfortable with the trading in this range at this point in time. Uh, you know, near term, it seems to be under a bit of pressure. And, uh, you know, we'll know what happens in terms of the Jackson Hole speech sometime later this week yeah. and how it affects how, the dollar. How, how critical it is? I think it's reasonably critical again because, you know, let's face it, asset markets uh, across the globe have rallied on expectations that there'll be more monetary easing. And uh, if the speech suggests that that's not going to happen, then the risk is definitely on the downside. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how, according to you, are global factors playing out? We, we, we witnessed a recent trend which was quite interesting. We saw a clutch of banks and institutions going overseas and raising bonds, 10 times oversubscribed, a 500 million issue, $5 billion worth of subscriptions coming in. Uh, one got the impression that perhaps the liquidity tap is opening again. Is that the sense you're getting? It is. I mean, uh, you know, the liquidity tap has actually been uh, open for quite some time now. I mean, if you look at this year, 2012, 
I mean, YTT, we've got more than $12 billion in equities alone. So I think the liquidity tap is doing quite well. And, you know, there is an enthusiasm to invest in India mm. because, you know, uh, despite all the agonizing we do, mm. uh, I mean, you know, we're perhaps a little better off than a lot of other places. Mm. So the enthusiasm is definitely there. It's, you know, the extent to which we can capitalize on it. Mm. So let's uh, go down deep a little bit more into some of our own sectors here, uh, Bharat, just to understand. Which are the sectors according to you right now which will perhaps benefit the most as we turn the tide as and when we do? Well, I guess in terms of, you know, uh, the area that we are most constructive on from a local perspective yes. is financials. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been overweight that sector since the beginning of the year. It's done well. But uh, I still think there's more juice in it. Basically because, one, valuations are not demanding. It's reasonably underowned. Mm -hmm. And if there is any policy action, I think it's, you know, the sector that's going to benefit the first. Because, you know, a lot of other sectors require a lot of granular activity and granular action. Whereas this is a sector that, you know, benefits from any broad-based uh, 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 reforms that we see or any broad-based policy measures that we see. You're not worried about the banks? Well, actually, you know, the, the big concern on the banks uh, through this year that we've been hearing for nearly, you know, a year, mm. or probably more than a year is, uh, you know, the, uh, the NPLs and the bad loans. Uh, we've done some work on this, and uh, what we figured was that, uh, you know, if you look at uh, this credit cycle versus past credit cycles, I mean, there are two discerning, uh, you know, trends this time around. First, in the past, you know, uh, every time there's been an implosion in the credit cycle, it's always been preceded by very high loan growth. Hmm. Whereas, if you look at the last four years since the global financial crisis, you know, loan growth has averaged 18 to 20 percent. So it's not been extremely high. It's not been a cause of concern. Secondly, again, if you see the loan pie itself, uh, this time around, if you see since 2008, uh, the share of many segments like agriculture, SMEs, personal finance, they've all actually shrunk as a percentage of the loan pie. The only segment that has grown really is large caps mm -hmm. and that to the infrastructure sector. Uh, so I, ca I guess, you know, what's happened this time is there is actually a concentration risk. It's not an endemic problem as it used mm -hmm. to be in past cycles. And you can again look at this as an opportunity and a threat. I'd prefer to look at it as an opportunity because an endemic problem is that much more difficult to sort out. Whereas since you have a concentration risk this time, policy action can actually you know, alleviate it quite easily if there is the desire. Do you see that policy action coming? I think you articulated a little while earlier that inflation remains sticky. That's been the RBI stand. What is your own view? Well, actually, you know, this doesn't call for monetary easing as such. Mm. What we're really looking for is, you know, you need to sort out problems. In no, terms I was of talking about financials now being a favorite <laughs> okay. because the, when again, the cycle in, turns. Uh, yeah, again, you know, as far as the financial, uh, as far as the RBI is concerned, I think, you know, let's face it, they've actually done a fair bit mm. through this year. I mean, again, you know, the, the Hawks will agonize that, uh, you know, uh, core inflation is sticky and nothing's been done. But let's look at it from the beginning of the year. You've cut the benchmark policy rate by 50 basis points. You cut the CRR by 125 basis points. And I think, you know, if you had asked a lot of people uh, whether this was enough at the beginning of the year, I think they would have been happy. Hmm. Again, let's look at the trend in GDP. I think, you know, if, you know, we'll have a GDP print out very shortly and say if it's below 5% or thereabouts, and if that trend continues through the festive season, because, you know, consumption, typically a lot of the demand tends to get bunched up over the next two, three mm. months, which is the festive season. I don't see any reason why the RBI will not cut again, sometime through the course of the fiscal year. Mm. And again, if that happens, the financials will be first order beneficiaries. Mm. What about uh, the whole consumption theme? Because again, a lot of people are raising now questions that maybe they've run up too much, the valuations out there, and maybe it's time to move away from defensives. Uh, what's your view today on consumptions and pharma defensives? Uh, healthcare, we are still positive because, you know, it's a very resilient space in terms of demand benefits from the rupee depreciation because most of our companies really tend to, you know, derive most of their earnings from overseas and valuations are not very demanding. As far as the consumption space, I'd really split that up into two parts, you know, staples and discretionary. Yeah. Uh, what I'm, I think, you know, you're right. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the problem area for consumption from a, uh, a market perspective really is that one, valuations are expensive and the sector is very, very overwhelmed. Mm. That said, I think, you know, it's, 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 it's a very structural theme in India. So very difficult to ignore it for prolonged periods of time. Near term, I'm, I'm fairly bearish on uh, uh, the discretionary side because I think, you know, be it sustained high inflation, uh, high interest rates or, you know, the bad monsoon, all of that's definitely going to impact uh, discretionary spending. And we saw that during the recent result season as well, you know, with most discretionary companies uh, reporting performance below expectations. And I guess things have not gotten any better. 
I mean, you know, inventories are high, there's massive discounting going on. So I would be very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, very, very concerned about that space. Staples is slightly different. I think, you know, as, uh, you know, we're getting the benefit of the demographic dividend in that sense. And, you know, once you get locked into uh, a usage pattern, it's very difficult to pull out. Mm. But yes, I mean, the space does suffer from problems in terms of, you know, uh, over ownership and expensive valuations. We have a more neutral kind of stance out there. Let's talk about another sector which you personally have tracked, uh, telecom. Mess. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, there is a fair degree of regulatory uncertainty out there. And, uh, you know, it doesn't help that, you know, there's a fair degree of competitive uh, intensity as well. So, yes, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult space right now. What would you do with it? Well, I think, uh, you know, we were running an underweight stance on that space. Uh, we've since, you know, I, I think valuations have gotten to very reasonable levels. So it's a little difficult to bet against it in a negative sense. Mm. But, yeah, I'd probably be neutral on that space at this point in time. Because, yes, the challenges have not gone away, but perhaps they're fairly well reflected in terms of valuations. What about uh, infrastructure? You talked about it a little bit earlier, but uh, again, there are lots of headwinds. Do you see things picking up there? Power, for example, oil and gas? How do you see that? Really? Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, th th there's a lot of uh, regulatory uncertainty there again. And, well, you, you can find, uh, you know, pockets of uh, safety like the uh, state-owned utilities, for example, uh, you know, which have a fairly well-defined uh, earning stream and uh, fairly well-defined uh, growth uh, prospects too. But that said, I guess, you know, the space is interesting provided you have a slightly longer-term uh, time frame in mind mm. because, you know, stocks are extremely cheap and they, they seem to reflect a fair amount of the distress that the companies are facing. And I think in select names, there's a fair degree of optionality. But, uh, you know, it's going to take some time for that optionality to be unleashed. So, yeah, if you have a two to three year time frame in mind, I think the sector can offer very good value. But if you're looking at it on an immediate term basis, then I guess stick to the state owned utilities and, uh, you know, uh, wait for uh, the mm. policy environment to clear out. My final question to you, if the government in the next eight weeks does not do anything of the kind that you expect or the market expects, expects. it to do, what would be the headline of your next report? Faith lost? I wouldn't say faith lost. As I said, uh, Vivek, you know, politics is the art of the possible. And, that's hope. Uh, you know, <laughs> I'm yeah. If the hope is belied, so, no, what would you do? I, I would reconcile to, you know, I, I would reconcile to this market being cheap for some time to come. I mean, as I said, you know, the market is cheap, but, you know, it needs triggers to go up. And if you don't see the triggers, I'd reconcile to the markets remaining cheap. That doesn't mean that, you know, you can't make money even uh, then because, you know, let's face it, earnings will grow at 8 to 10%. Hmm. And, you know, that will that, that, lead markets uh, higher on a, 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 if, if, if you were to look at it on a one or two year basis. So I think there'll still be money to be made. But yes, I mean, uh, you, you won't get the kind of returns that one wants. Thank you very much, Bharat, for talking to us here on Market Guru. Thank you. That was Bharat Ayer of JP Morgan here on Market Guru. Lots more coming up on Bloomberg TV India.